morning. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. It reads like this. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury, and many who were rich put in much. But then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which made a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance. But she, notice here, out of her poverty, put in all she had, her whole livelihood. Her whole livelihood. And, and why am I reading this scripture to you this morning? I believe this. I believe, how I many know when you love something, you're willing to give your all for that thing? How many of you have something in your life that you love? How many of you love God? Do you love God? Some of you need to look more happy about that. How many of you love God? Okay. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Thank you. I can't think of a better time to speak a message like this than right now as we get ready to go into a season of giving. There's a funny story about a miser. A miser is someone who's kind of, um, I don't know how you say it in Spanish, but kind of tight. Amen? Miser. Go, okay, how? Codo. Whatever. Tight. <laughs> and there's a story about this miser. The miser was called then by the charity chairman of the community. And the man said, sir, said the fundraiser, our records show that despite your membership, you've never once given to our cause. The man responded, and he says, do your records show that I have an elderly mother who was left penniless when my father died? Fume the tightwad. Do your records show that I have a disabled brother who is unable to work? Do your records show <laughs> that I have a widowed sister with small children who can barely make ends meet? No, sir, replied the chairman. Our records don't show any of those things. Well, then, I don't give to any of them, so why in the world would I give to you? <laughs> I don't know if anyone knows a person like that, but I think one of the things that is one of the most important qualities you find in a giver is someone with the right attitude. How many know every week we've been talking about the traits of the greats? And how many know that attitude is so important, especially when you talk about the attitude of giving? That anybody who is a giver or someone who's generous, you will first find in them that they have the right attitude. And this very familiar story in the Bible that we read points us to how Jesus observed a woman and the type of attitude she had regarding giving. When we read about this widow who gave the two mites, very quickly, there are really three things we should notice about her. Number one is that the woman was alone. She was all by herself. Her husband had died. The Bible tells us that she was a widow, and in those days, to be a widow quite possibly could have been one of the worst things to be. She had no one to provide for her. But what I find interesting is that even though this woman had been devastated by the loss of her husband, she continued to walk in her faith, regardless of her circumstances, regardless of her situation. And how many know sometimes we go through things in life where sometimes we can just make all kinds of excuses? But what you find about this woman is that there was no excuse when it came to her relationship with God. She was alone, but she certainly was not lonely. And that's a word for some of you that have been through things this year. That's a word for some of you who have been abandoned or you've struggled or you've had circumstances that have totally shifted your life. They've caused for you to feel alone. Well, I'll tell you, you can be alone, but it doesn't mean you have to be lonely this morning. How many know you can still have a relationship with the Lord? And this is what she had. She may not have had a husband, but she had the Lord in her life. She had a church that she belonged to. She had a faith that she lived by. She lived according to the command of God. And I want to tell you, her relationship with God is what made her strong regardless of her circumstances. 
So the first thing we see is that she was alone. The second thing we see is that she was poor. Let me take that back. She wasn't poor. She was po. She couldn't even afford the O and the R. She was po. She was poor and lonely. She was poor. She didn't have anything to her name in this earth. But how many know even though she didn't have anything in her, in, in her name in this earth, she had an account in heaven. And how many know when you have a relationship with the Lord, you're building an account with the Lord in heaven? How many of you want to go to heaven? <laughs> well, what's your account look like? This woman had an account in heaven. She had first given herself to the Lord. And I think that's important when you think about people who are generous and people who are blessed. The very first thing you're going to find about them is that they have given themselves first to the Lord. When Paul was celebrating the Macedonian churches, which were powerful churches in the New Testament, they were poor churches, but they were giving churches. There were churches that wanted to make a difference. There were people that wanted to be a part of the solution and not just the problem. And what Paul points out about the Macedonian churches is that they first gave themselves to the Lord. And if there's anyone here this morning that you desire to grow in this area of your life when it comes to giving and it comes to generosity, understand it cannot happen unless you have a relationship with the Lord. It cannot happen until you first come into personal contact with a God that is real, with a God that is powerful, with a God that is giving himself. Come on, somebody. He's not a God that came to take anything from us. He's a God that came to give something to us. And when you have a relationship with the Lord, you will never be poor. You'll never be poor because you are giving yourself to the Lord first. Giving is an overflow of our relationship with God. Anyone who's a giver, anyone who's a contributor to any cause, anybody who is helping to build the kingdom of God recognizes that it first comes from an overflow with their relationship with God. Here's my point. The closer you get to Jesus in a personal relationship with him, the more you will have the desire to give. Amen. Come on, somebody. Give God a good praise if you caught that little point right there. So the second thing is that she was poor. But the, the third thing we see about this woman, and this is something I think we can all draw from, is that she was an example. She was a, she was a widow. She was alone. She was poor. But all those factors didn't stop her from being a great example to you and I. Sometimes we think it's only the ones that are having success that are the examples. But in the world's terms, this woman was totally unsuccessful. She had no husband. She had no money. She had no status. But yet Jesus chose her to teach his disciples the type of heart they should have. And I think that's a message for some of us this morning who, who think we have it together on the outside. You've got an image to uphold. But I came to tell you, you can fool man with your outside, but you can't fool God with what's happening on the inside of you. He grabbed this woman and he made her an example. In fact, Jesus pulls her to the side and he begins to, I mean, pulls his disciples aside and he begins to celebrate her in front of the disciples. The reason he celebrated this woman, watch this, it wasn't because of the amount she gave, the amount of money she put into the offering. Watch this. He celebrates her because of the, the amount of money she kept back for herself. And you know what she kept back? She kept back for herself. Nothing. She gave everything she had to the Lord. There were men who had a lot of money who were walking by the offering, putting in large offerings, putting in large donations, walking piously into the temple, walking in with their image intact, walking it in with possibly with a servant or two, walking in with their gowns and their tunics, with their hats, looking religious. This poor little woman walked by. She put two mites in the offering bucket and she gave more than all those flashy givers. Why? Because she held nothing back for herself. These men, watch this. They they might have given a big gift, but they held back much more. They held back much more. And what am I bringing this message out to you this morning is because this ministry, the ministry of Victory Outreach, this church, Victory Outreach San Diego, was not built by people who held back. 
This church right here was not built by people who held back. These families, these marriages were not built by people who held back. The ministries in this church were not built by men and women who held back. This ministry is here today because there were men and women who were grateful that Jesus delivered them, that Jesus set them free when the system rejected them, when the schools failed them, when family let them down. There was a God in heaven who sent his son Jesus who didn't count them out. He counted them in and out out of gratefulness hear this out of gratefulness hear this out of gratefulness not in a deserving spirit well you ought to bless me you ought to take care of me you're supposed to be the church you're supposed to love me it's not about what we can do for you it's about what you can do for God because you are grateful for what he has done I came to tell you man didn't save you I didn't save you the leaders didn't save you the building didn't save you it was the blood of Jesus that saved you we know we are lucky enough to be given a purpose a destiny and a vision in this place if you are a part of victory outreach i'll tell you there's only one qualifying factor you want to hear what it is you don't got to be smart you don't got to be good looking you don't got to be educated but you must be grateful <laughs> let me talk to this side you don't got to be smart you don't got to have all the right connections you don't got to have it together but one thing you must be if you're going to be a part of this church you must learn to be grateful you must learn to give God glory for everything in your life oh come on and help me preach this morning that's the truth Jack we ought to be the most grateful people in this place and let me tell you something when you're grateful you don't hold anything back for yourself how many know when you love something, you give your all? Do you love that husband? You give your all. Do you love that wife? You give your all. you love those kids? Oh, you love those kids. Some of you even worship your kids. You got a little altar for your kids. You just worship those kids even more than God. But I came to tell you something. When you love something, you give everything you have. What about God? Has God been good to you? Has God been faithful to you? Has God come through to you for you time and time and again? I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you love God, come on and give him the praise that he's worthy of. Don't give him no golf clap now. That's good for Tiger Woods. But if you love Jesus, I want you to give him praise. I want you to thank him. I want you to say, Lord, you get all the glory. I hold nothing back for myself. Woo. That's what makes this ministry great. What makes this ministry great is it's built by men and women who held nothing back. Those chairs you have were bought by men and women who held nothing back. You didn't buy those chairs. We didn't buy those chairs. The mother church bought those chairs and then blessed us with a thousand of them. Can you thank God for that? This sound system, these cameras, this stage, this carpet, that children's department, all this that we have was given by people who didn't hold back, who loved God so much that they may not have been a millionaire, but they had gratefulness in their heart and they knew how to give. See, we haven't built this ministry on millionaires. We've built this ministry on grateful folk. On people who know what it is to be saved by a God that's real. Somebody say amen. amen. And I want to tell you, we're getting ready to take it to a whole nother level. We're going to take it to a whole nother level. The, the, the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the glory of the former house. And that, how many think that, that's the way it ought to be? How many know that God will only call you in one of three directions? He'll either call you forward. He'll call you up or he'll call you deep, but he'll never call you backwards. And some of you who are living in the past, you need to wake up. You need to wake up because God doesn't call you back. The devil calls you back. God is calling you forward. God is calling you in the future. God's saying the, the glory of the latter house. I'll wait on you. The glory of the latter house is going to be great. There's a rain coming. There's a revival coming. There's a breakthrough coming. Come on, some of you, God is getting ready to do something new in your life. The glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the glory of the former house. I want them to put this up on the screen. This is what the house is going to look like. That's how much you love your church? That's it. How many love your church? Love the house of the Lord. 
We're going to have 1,400 seats. We're going to be state-of-the-art, brand new. Come on, somebody. We've already acquired another property for 50 more parking slots. Come on and give God a big shout and a praise. That's how your church is going to look. And God wants you to be a part of it. God wants to use you. Tell your neighbor, God wants to use you. He wants to use you to usher in a revival. He wants to use you to usher in the supernatural. I believe this with all my heart. You say, well, can God use me? Of course he can. The Bible says he chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He's looking for a grateful people. Are there any grateful people here this morning? He's looking for people that are not going to hold back, but they're going to give their all for the glory of God. And I'll tell you this, man, this is the house that God wants to use this service to build. This is the house that God wants to use you to build. He, he wants you to go to another level when it comes to God's plan in your life. The reason I bring out this woman is because I think many of us can relate to her when it comes to the area of giving. There's a few things I want to bring out in this scripture that I think will minister to you, and I really want you to, to hear this. Number one, we learn here that our giving never goes unnoticed. Our giving never goes unnoticed. How many know Jesus sees everything? In the story, he actually positioned himself by the offering bucket. That's heavy. I think that'll change the way people give right away. If you realize that every time that bucket passes, it crosses your shadow, the Lord's watching you. Hello, somebody. Be like, yee hole. He, he, he positioned himself. He wanted to see who was giving with all their heart. He positioned himself up opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And it's important to know that the Lord watches over the collection. Now, he doesn't watch the way we think. He's not looking for the amount we give. But like I said before, he's looking to see whether we're withholding or not. Whether withholding. He wants to know if we're doing things the way the word of God teaches us to do them. And how many know when you look at the Bible, it teaches us to tithe? All right? To tithe. Now, you can always tell who, who's a giver because when you ever talk about tithe, they smile. They look at you like, come on. But then the ones, you're like, ooh. They get a little squirrely on you. Shut down on you. And then there's those that are just curious. They just want to learn about it. Someone say tithe. The Bible teaches us to tithe. What's a tithe? 10% of all our income. So it's not about the amount. It's about whether you're doing what's right or not. How many know 10% is what's right before the eyes of God? And so these men were giving, but they weren't bringing in the full tithe. But this woman was actually going beyond the tithe because she wasn't just giving the 10%. The Bible says she gave everything. And I'm going to tell you, this is the spirit that God is looking for in a giver. God is looking for somebody that's not going to try to lie about it, try to scheme about it, try to cheat about it, trying to make excuses about it. He's looking for someone that's willing to trust him for every area of their life. See, when it comes to giving, there's a few types of givers. Number one, there's those who give out of obligation. These are the people who give because, you know, they're obligated to give. They don't necessarily give with joy. You know, they're doing it because they're being told to do it. Sometimes these are what you would call grumpy givers. Oh, here. Okay, you're going to speak on it here. Like at the end, you're going to say here. Now, don't get me wrong. We're going to take it. <laughs> Because in the Old Testament, according to the law, they were commanded to give. They were, they were commanded to give the tithe no matter what. Someone say, no matter what. If you, if you were grumpy, you gave. If you were happy, you gave. If you were sick, you gave. If you were a pagan, you gave. Come on, somebody. You had to give. Someone say, had to give. So there's those people that they give. They come and say, well, I got to give. I got to do it. Those are what you call the grumpy givers. But how many know God's not looking at what we give? God is looking at how we give. 
The Bible says that he rejoices over somebody that gives hilariously, gives out of love, gives out of joy. The second type of giver is the person who gives for recognition. These were the type of givers that Jesus was looking at. These were the guys that were taking big wads and had flashy clothes and all that. And they were putting it in the basket, right? And they were giving just to get some clout. They were clout chasing. Talk to me, somebody. They were trying to get, get some clout. They were trying to get some recognition. You know, they wanted everybody to know that they were giving. But how many know even though they were giving, they were not giving the whole time? They weren't giving at all. Come on, somebody. Jesus is not looking at what we give. He's looking at our motive to giving. See, Jesus is looking for somebody that when they give, watch this, they give with the desire to please God. They're not trying to please man. When you give to your church and you pay your tithes on a Sunday morning, you're not pleasing me, my friend. You're pleasing God. You're pleasing the Lord with your life. And you know the benefit of that? The benefit is that the more you give with an attitude to please God, the more the Lord says, now I can trust you with more. Now I can give you more. Now I can increase your business. Now I can increase your home. Now I can increase your finances. Now I can cancel debt because I know that when I bless you, you're not going to hold anything, everything back. You're going to give me what belongs to me. You are a faithful steward. You're somebody that I can promote in the kingdom of God. And then third, the third type of giver, which I think is the best type of giver. How many want to be a great giver? It's the women. It's the, not the women. It's the people. The women like to give. Right, ladies? Yes, they love to give. Guys? All right. God bless too. All right. Like, don't let us fall behind. So you have those that give out of obligation, those who give for recognition. But this is the best type of giver. Watch this. It's those who give out of affection. It's those that their giving is driven by love. When you love something, you're willing to give everything you have to that thing. This Christmas, gifts are going to be exchanged to in-laws and outlaws and cousins and uncles and theos. Come on, somebody. And you know the people you love, they're going to get the best gifts, aren't they? And the people that you don't love so much, they're going to get a gift card for $10. Talk to me, somebody. The best type of givers. <laughs> that's cold. I was sort of like, that's cold. Don't give me no $10 gift card. But the best type of givers are the people that give out of affection. They give because they love God so much and they love his work so much and they love people so much and they're so grateful for what God has done in their life that they can't help but to give. They can't help but to sow. They can't help but to put something into God's kingdom so that his kingdom can be advanced. See, I believe that there's not only those who give out of affection, but I want to tell you about this fourth type of giving that I think some of us need to move into because you've got people in our church that you are affectionate givers. You love God. You love his work. You love the vision. You love this new building. You say, I'm going to give. But let me tell you about a fourth type of giver that I just discovered. It's called an extravagant giver. There are women in the Bible that didn't just give out of love, but they gave out of extravagance. There was one woman that was so grateful that Jesus set her free that she had a bottle of precious oil. And even the disciples could not see the value. They said, we could sell that and give that to the poor. But Jesus rebuked them and said, no, the poor you will always have. But this woman understands who's standing before her, that I'm the one that set her free. I'm the one that delivered her. And she's giving me all the glory. Extravagant givers, those that don't just give out of obligation or guilt or necessity or to put on a show or even out of love, but those who are so grateful that they say, I'm willing to give everything. Come on and give God a big, big praise. I'm almost done. So the first thing is our giving doesn't go unnoticed. The second thing is our giving doesn't go unappreciated. Jesus celebrates this woman's actions, and now she becomes a powerful example, a powerful example of a woman who has strong faith. And I want to tell you this, my friend, there's no greater reward, no greater reward in the kingdom of God than to be an example for God's glory. 
There's no greater reward than to walk as an example for those that are hurting, for those that are struggling, for those that are stuck. There's no greater, greater, greater reward. I'll tell you, there's, there's no greater reward in my life than to be a leader who could be an example. That when people look at my life and they look at my marriage and they look at my family, and I'm not perfect now. I got all kinds of flaws, and my kids are crazy just like yours. Well, maybe not as, as crazy as some of yours, but, you know, they're pretty crazy. They're crazy. Kids are crazy. They drive you crazy. That's my point. We all got our thing. We all got our problems. But there's no greater reward in my life. There's no house I could live in, car I could drive, restaurant I could eat at, place I can go, than to walk as an example for God in the city of San Diego. There's no greater reward that to say that I am a servant of God, that God has done a miracle in my life, that God has set me free, that God has taken the foolish things of the world and confound the wise, that God has raised me up when man saw nothing in me, God saw something in me, and God uses me as a trophy of his grace, and there's no greater reward than for God to say, look at my son, look at my daughter, how they're serving me with all their hearts. How many desire to be an example for the Lord? He used this woman. He rewarded her because she was an example. But you know that God, he won't only reward you by celebrating you and raising you up as an example. But here's what I believe with all my heart is that God will bless you financially. He will. Now I'm going to need your help. How many of you, since you've become a tither, you have been blessed by the Lord? You've been by you, 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 God has provided for you. Come on, let me hear you. God has provided for you. You will find that the people who put God first in their money, they're not struggling like those who don't. They're not stressed out. That's one of the first things. When you tithe, you're not stressed. You never get stressed. You know the scripture, Matthew 6, 3, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God is right in all things shall be added unto me. But you ever met someone that they're always stressed? How am I going to pay my cell phone? How am I going to pay my car? How am I going to get my kids to get the tooth filled? And I got to go to TJ, and it's too expensive. And how am I going to pay my registration? Whenever I hear someone like that, I look at them and say, that person must not be a tither. Because the Bible says that Christ will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Come on and help your pastor this morning. I don't walk stress. And if I lose something, I lose something. You ever lost something? Right? Come on, tithers. You ever lost something? You know what I say? God must have wanted to remove that. In fact, you know, God must have something better for me because I'm a tither and I trust God with my mind, heart, and strength. Come on, somebody. So God raises you up to be an example. But secondly, man, he blesses you financially. I believe there's some of us here this morning, even Christians, people that go to church. It's crazy to me. People that go to church that need the curse of poverty broken in your life. God hasn't called you to stay on welfare. He hasn't called you to stay on EBT. He hasn't called you to be struggling to make ends meet all the time. That see, they never meet. They no, no, no. God gets no glory out of you struggling. God gets no glory. God gets glory when the people of God trust Him and rise up and is as an example of blessing within their life. Come on and give God a praise if you believe it. Let me ask you. Let me put it this way. I'm almost done preaching. You get some? Do you think God gets glory out of us? You ever stop and think? Look at this building. All right, we're from the ghetto. Ghetto. You know, we, we shop at Target and Walmart and swap meats. But when you look at a building like this, you look at the people we are, how some of us look this morning, you look sharp to me, you look like you never broke a plate in your life. You look cleaner than the board of health. You look cooler than the other side of the pillow this morning. Who would have thought 
people like us could be changed by the power of the living God. Who would have thought it? You should have seen the police. See, the police used to chase us. They used to bust us. They used to pull us over. They used to come to our path. Now they want to work with us. Come on, somebody. Now they want to work with us. And when we were, well, you know, we had the mayor last week. Who remember we had the mayor and the chief of police? And the cops were coming. They were coming. You know how they came? They walked in to the, to the lobby one day. We're, having, we're here at work. We're upstairs working. The receptionist comes, Pastor Al. San Diego PD's here. And I, man, get Johnny Duran on the phone, man. Listen. Okay, I go, call Johnny. Have Johnny talk to him. No, 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 Pastor. They don't want Johnny. They won't talk to you. I said, oh, my God. I thought, <laughs> I was kidding. Huh? I got nervous. I, cops still make me nervous. I thought so. <laughs> and I went out there. I went out there. I go, can I help you? Big old cops, man. Two big old cops. One, one black cop, one Mexican cop. I felt like I, I, I was going to assume the position. Like I was ready. <laughs> Is it you, Pastor Al? I go, yes. Maybe. He said, we wanted to meet you because we hear of all the good you're doing in the community. In fact, we see it. We're from the precinct right here. Captain Jerry Har is our captain. We drive by the church every day. We see all those turkeys you give out. We see all the toys you give out, all the candy you give out, all the services, all the events. Place is always packed, always on fire. People always change. We know about your homes. We know that the neighborhood's getting better because Victory Outreach is in it. And, it, and he said, it just so happens that the mayor wants to put on an event in the community. But we talked to the mayor and we said, we can't do this event unless Victory Outreach San Diego heads up the event. Come on, let's talk about you. Who would have thought people like us could do anything good? We were a part of the problem. We were all messed up, but one day Jesus came in, and now we are a part of the solution. We are a part of the answer. We're a people of dignity. See, how does God reward us? He rewards us in our testimony, but, man, he rewards us financially as well. You should have seen our church when we moved here 16 years ago. Can I talk a little bit more? When we moved here 16 years ago, the church was about 75 people. The church had gone through all kinds of stuff. Some of you might have remembered. Some of you might have heard. Some of you may not have had a clue. And I remember the parking lot was always something that stood out to me. Because the cars that the people were driving, they're hoopties. I mean, there were a lot of hoopties out there. I remember some of the bumpers on the cars were held by duct tape. You had window tinning coming off and faded paint. And we rolled up to the church and you see all these cars. And you're like, Man, these people need some cars. Praise God. I remember we had a nice car. I had a, that time I had a Cadillac Escalade. Because I had it. I've, I've been blessed. I've been blessed. Right. And we used to park it right here in the front. And the young people after service would come out and they'd get their keys and on the way out they'd key my car. They were trying to make my car look like theirs. That's no, true. And I'd come off the pulpit. That's why I park on the side, y'all. <laughs> no, they don't deal no more. They keyed Miller's car, they keyed Regina's cars, all keyed. I remember one time I was preaching. We used to be able to see, before we cover this, you could see out there. And I'd be preaching. And one day I was preaching, giving a good word, man. People were jumping and shouting for the Lord, excited, dancing. I looked out the window, and I saw a tow truck. 
Now, you couldn't see it, but I could see everything. That's why I covered it. And I'm preaching like the fire of God, revival. People are gasping. Like, holy Ghost, Holy Ghost power. Holy Ghost power. Go, Holy Ghost, go. Victory outreach in the house. Jesus in the house. Kill my body. Miracle, miracle time. I'm getting silly. I got to eat something right now. <laughs> Miracle time. And I'm preaching. I see the tow truck go here. And the driver. Dee, 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 dee. People are dancing. And all of a sudden, the tow truck backs up. And I see the guy get out. And one of the cars right in the front, right there. There's revival in the church tonight. There's revival in the church tonight. There's revival. I got the Holy Ghost upon you right now. And everybody's dancing, and I'm looking at the tow truck jack up this car. <laughs> and as soon as service over, I mean, it was electric in here, boy. This lady comes up to me. What? They towed my car in the middle of the service because my husband hasn't been paying the bills. And then I checked and I noticed they weren't tithing. But we were having church. Boy, people were laying on the carpet. They were throwing blankets on everybody. Man, you, oh, look at you're getting the Holy Ghost. You're getting, yeah, but while you're getting the Holy Ghost, the devil's ripping off your mind. And that day I woke up, I said, no more devil. Yes, God wants to bless us spiritually. Yes, God wants to break curses. Yes, God wants to deliver us. But I also believe that God wants to bless the people of Victory Outreach financially. No more tow trucks. No more repossessions. No more debt. No more IRS debt. And little by little, we begin to cancel debt. We begin to buy homes. We begin to build businesses. Who would have thought people like us yes. could do something like this? But how many know we're going to do it? How many know we're going to do it in Jesus' name? And guess what? We're still going to do it. But we're going to do that on the way to Bank of America. And on the way to Wells Fargo. Give me some money. Give me some money. You got to believe this stuff. How many can say amen? How many believe the same revival God gives you in your body is the same revival God could give you in your finances, in your money? And I pray for you that as you learn to tithe, someone say tithe, tithe. that man, you're going to receive that reward. Let me give you the last thing, and that's it as I'm done. Our giving doesn't go unrewarded as Matthew comes. Did you get this today? I know we have a lot of people here that you might be coming for a little while or you've been coming for a long while and you still haven't taken hold of this principle, man. And let me tell you, let the struggle begin today. Understand that when you put God first in your finances, oh my God, oh, you're going to be blessed. And the first, time, the first person that's going to be happy for you is going to be me. The first person. You should see how I get when they get blessed. Pastor, I got to tell you, there's funny people want to tell me first. And I want them to tell me first. Pastor, I got to check. Praise God. You know, I'm not one of those guys that's okay, pay your tithes. No, I don't do that. <laughs> if you win the lottery, I might make you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Pastor, I got to check. Okay, praise God. Amen. Pastor, I started a business. Praise God. I'm the first one at the ground open. Pastor, I bought a home. I want to pray over that home. Pastor, God bless me and my wife. Praise God. I want to be a part of that. 
I want to celebrate with you. I want to celebrate with you. I want to be a part of what God is doing in your life. Is that okay? But we have to activate our faith. Activate our faith. And I'm not asking for a big offering today. I'm saying just pay your tithes. Just make a commitment today, especially those of you that know you've struggled in this area for too long. Or maybe you have fought it for a long time. Make a decision today. It's okay to come in here and get blessed. I don't have no problem with that. Come and dance. Now, come and dance and take off your shoes and throw a chancla. It's fine. <laughs> but don't have your car repossessed while you're throwing a chancla. <laughs> don't have these financial issues. Now, if you have financial issues, you say, well, I have real financial issues. Well, here's the cure. Whenever you have a need, sow a seed. Whatever seed you sow is the harvest you will possess. And if you want oranges, plant orange seeds. You can't plant an orange seed and get a watermelon. It doesn't work. So if you want finances, take your finances and plant them in God. I want you guys to take that seed and multiply it. See, because I want you to be a part of the latter rain. This is going to be nice. This is going to be powerful. I'm, one of the big things I'm looking forward to was when we opened this up to 1,400 seats. We only have one service on Sunday. Gracias, Señor. Gracias, Lord. 16 years of doing double services, sometimes triple services. As the young people say, I'm done. I'm dead. I'm not lit. I'm dead. I'm not lit. I'm dead. I can't wait to see how we're going to get all the family together on one service on Sundays, worshiping the Lord. How many think that's the way it ought to be? That's the way it ought to be. So all I'm saying is I want you to get a hold of this principle now before the year is over. If you've struggled in this area, struggle no longer. If, you, if, you've, if you've wandered away from your commitment, come on back to committing to tithe. The whole tenth, not eight, not seven, not six. The whole 10% belongs to the Lord. Can I hear an amen? So here's what I want to do. We're going to pray in a moment. Did you like this message? Okay. Good. I enjoyed teaching it. I love teaching on giving, man. It's great. If you need a tithing envelope, lift up your hand. And we have a lot of tithers already, but if you'd like to raise your giving, you can do that as well. The first service, we saw a commitment to raise the giving. If you don't have the application... You can go to the Apple Store and download the Victor Outreach San Diego app. We have hands going up everywhere, ushers. We have the app. A lot of our church gives online. We even have some people that give out of direct debit. It just take it out of the check every payday. And that makes it easy. You know, when I do that, it makes it easy for me to give more. We have hands over here, ladies. Ladies. There you go, Renee. Let's move quicker if we can. Renee, uh, over here, Albert. Who has the app? Can I see who has the app? Let me see if you have it on your phone. Okay, good. A good portion of us. We're also going to give you this little bookmark with me and Georgina. That's a good picture of us. There's not a lot of pictures of us, but when we get a good one, we use it till kingdom come. <laughs> so here it is. That's a good one. And we put on the big bookmark. Hopefully, when you see the bookmark, you'll pray for your pastors. How many of you love us? Pray for our family. Pray for you guys. We love you guys. And it says 90-day challenge. Simply just for the next 90 days, committing to the Lord in every area. But remember, commit your life to him first. Get up in the morning.